At the root of this crisis is Dr. Mahade's desire to ensure that he remains in power. All his speeches and all his remarks point out to the siege mentality. He feels that the whole world is out to get him. The whole world is wrong. Only Mahate is correct. Dr. Mahathir Mohammed, stridently anti-British, anti-Zionist, at times anti-Australian, but never anti-development. The towers of Kuala Lumpur reflect a wealth that until now has more than answered his critics. But Mahathir's miracle is beginning to unravel, and he's turned to old methods to rein in dissent. He has had, as Prime Minister of this country, an extraordinary record over 20 years. He's gone against the odds, and he's won. Economists like Ken Curtis look with admiration on Mahathir's Malaysia. Beginning in July 1981, the strong-willed, irritable, unorthodox Prime Minister began guiding an economic transformation. This country has made unimaginable progress. Real income has increased annually to almost 9% a year during that period. People's income is four to five times higher today than it was but two decades ago. Until recent weeks, this man had been the ageing Prime Minister's deputy, friend and heir apparent. But on this night, Anwar Ibrahim asks supporters to join an event illegal in Malaysia and unthinkable during most of the Mahathir era, a rally against the 73-year-old leader. They just give a call about 10 minutes back, a few thousand already there. As we begin the one and a half hour drive south from Kuala Lumpur, there's a suggestion the government has just acted to stop the event. The authorities under instruction has now de decided to cancel the program and uh, switch off the lights at the hall. Anwar's security is nervous. A an issue of personal safety, this? Yes, because we are taking you into a situation where they switched off the lights. And Anwar, sacked just days earlier, can see the fingerprints of his old boss on everything that goes wrong. That's to deny my right to express my views. His character does not qualify him to become a leader of a country like Malaysia. Dr Mahathir was typically decisive when he moved against Anwar Ibrahim, sacking him as Deputy Prime Minister, as Finance Minister, and a day later leading his dumping from Malaysia's dominant political party, UMNO. Banished, Anwar also took a beating from local press long compliant with the Mahathir government. If the stories were right, this deputy prime minister and devout Muslim procured prostitutes, had homosexual affairs, offered bribes, even leaked state secrets. Anwar denied every charge. Menghina saya, menghukum saya dengan pelbagai tuduhan yang paling dahsyat. Saya terpaksa lawan untuk mempertahankan hak saya. I had never anticipated that the instruments of government would be abused to this extent. That people are threatened, you will be detained, you will be charged for offence perpetually committed five years back. If you do not admit to your wrongdoings or bribing Anwar or having illicit sexual relationship with him. What makes this case particularly disturbing is that the institutions of state have been able to get away with it. Political scientist Chandra Muzaffar sees the Anwar arrest as a crisis. Hello. A case where democratic institutions that should defend their independence at all costs have in fact been doing Mahathir's political dirty work. 
the Attorney General's chambers, the police, and even the judiciary have been uh, manipulated to serve the interests of uh, the Prime Minister. And this, I think, is a matter of grave concern for the nation as a whole. And this is why there is such a strong reaction from ordinary people. Particularly grave if the conspiracy reaches as high in the Malaysian power structure as the professor suggests. And as you'll see, this isn't a claim you make lightly in Malaysia. I don't think this would have happened without the support, perhaps the tacit support, of the most powerful man in the land today. Prime Minister Mahathir is implicated in this. This is the impression that a lot of people have. Your impression? It's also my impression. And Anwar Ibrahim's impression. The 51-year-old says he was set up by some of the government's most senior people, including at least one government minister, all working for Prime Minister Mahathir. But certainly he had the knowledge and certainly they perceive that he has given an approval. Since uh, the Deputy Prime Minister sack, we feel re relief that we have only one captain, one uh, leader. So much easier for us to overcome our economic uh, slowdown. The man Anwar deposed as Deputy Prime Minister five years ago, Gaffer Baba, is a staunch supporter of Dr Mahathir and of the judiciary. No, the government has no control over our judiciary here. Judiciary is quite independent in this country. We are proud of it. The politician does not bother about that. When we spoke with the 73-year-old a week ago, he was insisting Anwar had been treated fairly. I mean, uh, he's free, man. He's free, but he's free with an enormous amount of damage done to his career. Well, even in America, you can see you now how the people squeeze Bill Clinton. It's not proven guilty yet, and the book is already published by, by the prosecutor. As Anwar's convoy nears the rally site, a security stop. In fact, Anwar knew he wouldn't be free much longer. His security protected him, managing frantic roadside vehicle changes like this one. But no amount of guards and safety measures could prevent his arrest, because Anwar had lost Mahathir's blessing. Your personal safety is very important. No, we can't afford to take it. He had spoken with his wife and six children, telling them he was ready for prison. I have no regrets. I have said to Aziza and the children, Papa is prepared for the worst. We'll... Uh, this is the sacrifice I have to take and to make, and uh, I'm, uh, I have uh, committed myself to the reform movement, and will continue. And he'd already organised a successor to take over the movement. I think I will have to, but uh, whoever is around that also believe in this cause will be my um, uh, networking pe uh, people. Anwar's wife, ophthalmologist Dr. Aziza, insists her husband is innocent and says she is committed to a movement for reform. You have to have a free judiciary, independent, the police not to be coerced and taking orders from the top people and not to, uh, once you get the orders, to make it like a police state so that people in Malaysia are scared. There is no reform movement. It's only a blind is a way of uh, diverting attention from the problems, the reasons for his expulsion. But Anwar can cite other cases where Malaysia's justice system appears to have served government interests in dealing with dissent and maintaining public fear. This was Malaysian MP Lim Guan Eng just last month. Supporters gathering to recognise him on the eve of a judgment in his court case. The long-time government critic was in court for publicly defending a teenage girl, detained after she accused an UMNO party figure of rape. How can a rape victim be punished by being detained instead of those who raped her? 
His defence of the young girl earned him sedition and prohibited publications charges. The court not only turned down his appeal, but increased the penalty, sending him for one and a half years to jail. It is absurd. It is something that would never happen in a parliamentary democracy. But this has happened. And why was this possible? Partly because the executive wanted this sort of conviction, because the Attorney General's chambers pressed for this sort of conviction, and because the judiciary was prepared to go along with uh, what was obviously a traversity of justice. This, as Lim Guan Eng now knows, is where you finish up if you cross Mahathir's system of dealing with criticism. Prison outside Kuala Lumpur. He feels that it's necessary to uh, send a message to the people uh, of Malaysia that this is a price that you may have to pay if you speak out. Even though it's the truth, even though it is for justice. But of all Malaysia's measures to deal with government critics, this one is the most feared. The Internal Security Act is a hand-me-down of British colonial rule. Originally framed to deal with communists, it's still alive and active after four decades. And it's a breathtaking shortcut to prison. Under the ISA, the minister can send a person to jail without trial for any period not exceeding two years. And if the government thinks that isn't long enough, the minister can order as many successive two-year jail terms as he likes. And the accused never even sees the inside of a courtroom. For us, it's, a, it's an honour to, to go into Mahathir's Marriott. <laughs> Mahathir's Marriott. <laughs> the clink. <laughs> Elizabeth Wong is coordinator of a human rights group that helps families of ISA detainees. As far as we know, there are over 170 people detained under the Internal Security Act. Um, but to date, we have had like tens and of thousands of people detained since the 1950s. So just how bad are the conditions that some ISA detainees face? This is very typical of um, what ISA detainees would go through. They were forced to swallow their own excrement, violently tortured, abused during round-the-clock interrogation, causing severe injury and permanent damage. The letter smuggled out of a detention camp calls for international intervention to stop abuse of ISA detainees. The worst thing was mental torture, not physical torture. Putting you in a cell, every half an hour throwing water inside, you cannot sleep, spit on your food, and then uh, when you eat, they just blow their nose on your rice, and you just have to eat it. There's no other way. Geronimo Hussain says he was locked up for two years in the 1980s for changing his religion. Because it is a danger to the security of the country for an Islam to convert. He was afraid I would convert more Islamic people. You were preaching the gospel? Yes. And you were locked away for two years? Yes. Bob, as he likes to be called, goes to a service this week in a makeshift church two floors above a mechanic's workshop. Malaysia takes pride in its record of religious tolerance. Yet Mahathir's main tool of fear, the Internal Security Act, is present even in church. Bob insists he and his fellow converts from Islam have to pray at different churches each week to avoid arrest. They're afraid of being arrested by the government. For doing what? For, for studying the Christian religion. How can you have a law of this sort that allows the state to detain people without trial? Allowing a trial, a fair, just trial, is one of the basic rights of a human being in a democracy. It's not the right time yet to abolish it because still we have uh, bad people in this country. What do we do with this type of man? They are free to kill people. What about working harder to find the evidence to convict them? Well, of course, the, the police are working hard. The trouble is, uh, the trouble is, the public, the people, dare not go to court 
to give the evidence. That is a problem. In Malaysia, fear is a factor whether you argue for or against reform. Among others we interviewed, Professor Chandra, Anwar Ibrahim and Lim Guan Eng have all served time under ISA. How would you describe the health of free speech in Malaysia today? What free speech? <laughs> it is that bad. Malaysians are so afraid to speak. There's, there's this culture of fear, which, um, you know, there's a psychological barrier that anything that you say, that you discuss at the coffee shop now, for example, if it's anti-government, they, they think that they can be caught under the ISA. It's time to think about the ISA, okay? Um, it was something that the British handed down to us, um, and nobody's sort of really taken it away. It's a colonial relic. Meet Marina Mahatia, Malaysian newspaper columnist and daughter of the Prime Minister, outspoken on many issues, but on free speech, well, Marina's lukewarm. Free speech, as you know, uh, is a double-edged sword. I mean, it gave you Pauline Hansen. It could give us all sorts of uh, funny things as well. That's free speech too. And on the man now challenging her father, Anwar Ibrahim went to Marina's wedding. She once worked for him, but they're now pursuing different causes. Is he going to reform the Sharia courts so that it's fairer to women? I want to know about that. He should. Is he going to? I'm saying he should. Of Are you... course he should. But I see that all the people who don't want any reform in the Muslim courts are supporting him. So I worry about that. I'd love to believe him. But all these things worry me. But you don't believe him? I don't know. It's got to be more convincing. But not for the people of Malacca, south of Kuala Lumpur. It doesn't matter for the 15, maybe 20,000 Malaysians here that the lights are out and the hall locked, they improvise. The support for Anwar and for reform is unmistakable. It is uh, something extraordinary in the Malaysian uh, political landscape because we don't have expressions of public support of this sort, especially for someone who is standing up against establishment. The dominant elite and Dr. Mahathir Mohamed in particular feels threatened and whenever he feels threatened, you find that democratic space shrinks in our society. <laughs> The Prime Minister's backers insist this unprecedented defiance of their leader will quickly pass, that Mahathir alone can lead Malaysia out of a deepening economic crisis. He is the man who is really uh, in control of the party in the public and he understands fully about the economic situation and he got the idea how to overcome it. Here too, the Mahathir idea is to resurrect old methods of control. Malaysia's new turn away from free markets to strict currency controls has many who peaked praise on the country's economic achievements shaking their heads. It certainly took someone of the force of personality, of the current Prime Minister of Malaysia, to decide to go against the orthodoxy in this manner. If this is used to protect a vested interest in the status quo, then much of what's been gained in the last 20 years will disappear like dust faster than any can understand today. In Malaysia, it's long been clear who's calling the shots, but never clearer than now. For some, that's a comfort. At the moment, people just simply trust the Prime Minister. For others, it's precisely what's wrong with Malaysia. This is something which uh, disturbs me a great deal. As a student of politics, I ask myself, are we living in a feudal society where you have a leader who has got the Louis XIV syndrome, meaning by which he says, I'm satisfied, I'm king, I'm the nation, I've decided that this is wrong and this should not be and it must be so. If there's one person you hold most responsible for all of this, who is it? I'm going to regret saying this, but... Um Without a doubt, um, it's Dr. Mahathir Mohamad. He's... 
you know, it, it depresses me. It, it really does depress me. Um, you know, because I'll... <sighs> why, why are you going to regret saying it? Um, well, <laughs> because Mahathir has shown he does not take any dissent. And if there's anyone who would dare to come and say that he's the one who's caused all these problems, who's eroded all our fundamental rights, who's made life miserable for hundreds of people since he was Prime Minister. And he would just, you know, he could easily just detain anyone, you know, and um, it, it depresses me because, um, you know, we're such a vibrant, dynamic country, community, and it just takes one man to ruin it for a lot of people. I'm pretty sorry. <laughs>